Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course World History, and today is the penultimate episode of Crash Course. We're going to talk about globalization. This was going to be the last episode, but I just can't quit you, world historian. So today we're going to talk about globalization, and in doing so, we're going to talk about why we study history at all. Oh, oh, Mr. Green! Yes, me from the past? We study history to get a good grade, to go to a good college, to get a good job. So you can make more money than you would otherwise make, and be a slightly larger cog among the seven billion gears that turn the planet's economic engine, right? And that's fine, but if that's why you really study history, then you need to understand and all the ways that the t-shirt you're wearing is both the cause and result of your ambition. This t-shirt contains the global economy, its efficiency, its massive surplus, its hyper-connectedness, and its unsustainability. This t-shirt tells one story of globalization, so let's follow it. <laughs> So globalization is a cultural phenomenon. It's reflected in contemporary artwork and population migration and linguistic changes, but we're gonna focus, as we so often have during Crash Course, on trade. So the world today, as symbolized by our international felt melange, experiences widespread global economic interdependence. Now, of course, economic interdependence and the accompanying cultural borrowing are nothing new. You'll remember that we found trade documents from the Indus Valley civilization all the way in Mesopotamia. But for a few reasons, the scale of this trade has increased dramatically. One, multinational corporations have global reach and increasing power. Two, travel and shipping are cheap and safe. It took about two months to cross the Atlantic in 1800. Today, it takes about five hours by plane and less than a week by ship. Three, governments have decreased tariffs and regulations on international trade, leading to what is sometimes called, euphemistically, free trade. To which I say, if this trade is so free, how come BBC America is in the premium tier of my cable package? To understand the role that governments play in international trade, let's look again at this t-shirt. This t-shirt like most t-shirts made in the world, contains 100% American cotton. And that's not because the U.S. makes the best cotton or the most efficient cotton, it's because the U.S. government subsidizes cotton production. And that's what makes this cotton cheaper than cotton of similar quality from Brazil or India. But in the last 30 years, the U.S.'s share of cotton exports has gone down as Brazil, India, and Africa's cotton exports go up. And that trend will likely continue as the U.S. moves away from its expensive cotton subsidies. In fact, these days it's already possible to find t-shirts with Brazilian, Indian, or Ugandan in cotton, or a mixture of cottons from all around the world. But because the American government doesn't subsidize industry in the way it does agricultural production, the actual spinning and weaving of the cotton takes place in lower wage countries. Mexico, Guatemala, Vietnam, China, India, China, China, sometimes even China. And then the finished shirts, called blanks, are usually sent to Europe or the United States for screen printing and then sold. You would think the most expensive part of this process is the part where we ship this across the Pacific Ocean, turn it into this, and then ship it back across the Pacific Ocean. But you'd be wrong. Wholesale t-shirt blanks can cost as little as $3. The expense is in the printing, the retail side of things, and paying the designer at Thoughtbubble who was tasked with the difficult job of creating a Mongol who is at once cute and terrifying. So contemporary global trade is pretty anarchic and unregulated, at least by international institutions and national governments. Much of this has to do with academic economists, mostly in the US and Europe, who have argued with great success that governmental regulation diminishes prosperity by limiting growth. Now some nations in Latin America, the Caribbean, in Africa haven't been particularly keen to pursue free trade, but they've been bullied into it by larger economies with whom they desperately need to trade. So in the past 30 years, we've seen all these emerging markets lowering their tariffs, getting rid of regulation, and privatizing formerly state-run businesses. And they often do that to appease the International Monetary Fund, which offers low-interest loans to developing world economies with the motto, many strings attached. Now whether these decreased regulations have been a net positive for these developing world economies is a subject of much debate, and we will wade into it, but not until next week. First, we need to understand more about the nature of this trade. So you'll remember from the Industrial Revolution episode that industrial Western powers produced most of the manufactured goods, which were then sold in international markets. But you'll also remember that domestic consumption was extremely important. I mean, almost all early Model Ts were built by Americans, and bought by Americans. But since the 1960s, and especially today, former non-industrialized parts of the world have been manufacturing consumer goods for domestic markets, yes, but primarily for foreign ones. This t-shirt made in China and the Dominican Republic before being imported to Mexico and then to the United States is a primary example of what I'm talking about, but so is the computer that you're watching me on. Your computer was probably manufactured in China, but with parts from all over the world, especially Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea. And this international manufacturing is always finding like new markets too like Brazil for instance has a huge technology sector. They make iPads there, actually. Sorry, I'm trying to play Angry Birds. But what all these countries have in common is that while there is a domestic market for things like iPads and t-shirts, the foreign markets are much, much bigger. Oh, it's time for the open letter? 
An open letter to Cookie Monster. But first, let's see what's in the secret compartment today. Oh, it's a cookie dough flavored balance bar. For people who love cookies and pretending to be healthy. Dear Cookie Monster, here's the thing, man. You don't have a stomach. That's why when you put a cookie in your mouth, it crumbles up and then it just falls out of your mouth. But here's what fascinates me, Cookie Monster. I believe you when you say you love cookies. It doesn't matter that you can't actually eat cookies because where you would have a stomach, you instead have someone's arm. And that, Cookie Monster, is what makes you a beautiful symbol for contemporary consumption. You just keep eating, even though you can't eat. Cookie Monster, you are the best and the worst of us. Best wishes, John Green. So although diehard Marxists might still resist this, by 2012, it's become pretty obvious that global capitalism has been good for a lot of people. It's certainly increased worldwide economic output, and while American auto workers may suffer job loss, moving manufacturing jobs from high-wage to lower-wage countries allows a greater number of people to live better than they did when the first and second worlds monopolized manufacturing. And while I don't want to conflate correlation and causation, some 600 million people have emerged from poverty in the last 30 years, at least according to the World Bank's definition of poverty, which is living on less than $1.25 a day. Americans can argue about whether absurdly inexpensive clothes, shoes, and televisions are worth the domestic, economic, and social dislocation, but for the Vietnamese worker stitching a pair of sneakers, that job represents an opportunity for a longer, healthier, and more secure life than she would have had if those shoes were made in the USA. But before we jump on the celebratory globalization bandwagon, let's acknowledge that this brave new world has some side effects. For instance, it maybe hasn't been so good for families, it definitely has not been good for the environment, and also there's a chance that globalization will spark like the end of the human species. But we're gonna talk about all that next week. For today, let's bring on the bandwagon and ride straight for the thought bubble. So these days, people move more than they ever have. 21% of people living in Canada were born somewhere else, as was an astonishing 69% of Kuwait's current population. Migration has become easier because one, air travel is pretty cheap, especially if you only take a few plane trips in your life. Life, and two, it's relatively easy and inexpensive to stay in touch with relatives living far away thanks to Skype, mobile phones, and inexpensive calling cards. Also three, even with increased industrialization in the developing world, economic opportunities are often much better in wealthy countries. Remittances, money sent home by people working abroad, are now a huge driver of economic growth in the developing world. Like in Tajikistan, for instance, remittances are 35% of the country's total gross domestic product. With all these people moving around the world, it's not surprising that globalization also means cultural blending. When people move, they don't just give up their literary, culinary, artistic, and musical traditions. Globalized culture is a bit of a paradox, though, because some people see culture today as increasingly Americanized, right? Like, Friends is currently broadcast in over 100 countries. You can find Diet Coke for sale deep in the jungles of Madagascar. The NBA is huge in China. There are fewer languages spoken today and probably less cultural diversity. But on on the other hand, an individual's access to diverse cultural experience has never been greater. Bollywood movies, Swedish hip-hop, Brazilian soap operas, highlights from Congolese football matches, these are all available to us. Culinary cultural fusion is all the rage, more novels are translated from languages than ever before, although few are actually read. And in the surest sign of cultural globalization, football. The world's game has finally reached America, where broadcasts of the greatest collective enterprise humanity has ever known, Liverpool Football Club, got record ratings in 2012. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Hey, one last request. Could you put me in a Liverpool jersey on the pitch at Anfield, raising the Premier League trophy with Steven Gerrard hugging me? Yes, just like that. Oh, Thought Bubble, I love you so much. Okay, so this all brings us to how globalization has changed us and whether it's for the better. Assuming you make the minimum wage here in the United States, this t-shirt purchased at your friendly neighborhood e-tailer dftba.com will cost you about three hours worth of work. And yes, that does include shipping. By the time it arrives at your door, the cotton within that t-shirt will have traveled by truck, train, ship, possibly even airplane if you opt for priority shipping. And it will probably have traveled further than Magellan did during his famous circumnavigation of the globe. You get all that for three hours of work. By contrast, a far less comfortable garment several hundred years ago would have cost you 10 times as much work. But these improvements have been accompanied by change so radical that we struggle to contextualize it. Like, the human population of our planet over time looks like this. Dang.
Like in 1800, there were a billion human beings on this planet, and that was more than had ever been seen before. And we lived more than twice as long on average as humans did just two centuries ago, largely due to improved healthcare for women in childbirth and their infants, but also thanks to antibiotics and the second agricultural revolution that began in the 1950s, the so-called Green Revolution that saw increased use of chemical fertilizers lead to dramatically higher crop yields. Of course, these gains haven't been evenly distributed around the world, but chances are, if you're watching this, you A, survive childbirth, childbirth, and B, feel reasonably confident that your children will as well. That's a new feeling for humans, and as a parent, I can assure you, it's a miracle, and one to be celebrated. We study history so that we can understand these changes, and so that we can remember both what we've gained and lost in getting to where we are. Next week, our last week, we'll look at the many facets of globalization that aren't causes for celebration. But for today, let's just pause to consider how we got from here to here how the relentless and unquenchable ambition of humans led to a world where the entire contents of the Library of Alexandria would fit on my iPhone, along with recordings of everything Mozart ever composed. In such a world, it's easy to feel that we are big and powerful, maybe even invincible. It's easy to feel that, and also dangerous. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm John Green, and this is the final episode of Crash Course World History. Not because we've reached the end of history, but because we've reached the particular middle where I happen to be living. Today we'll be considering whether globalization is a good thing, and along the way we'll try to do something that you may not be used to doing in history classes, imagining the future. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, in the future I'm gonna get to second base with Molly Brown. No, you won't be from the past, but the fact that when asked to imagine the future, you imagine your future says a lot about the contemporary world. And listen to me from the past, well, there's no question that your solipsistic individualism is bad both for you and for our species, the broader implications of individualism in general are a lot more complex. Man, I'm gonna miss you, intro. So last week, ta-da, we discussed how global economic interdependence has led, on average, to longer, healthier, more prosperous lives for humans, not to mention an astonishing change in the overall human population. In the West, globalization has also led to the rise of a service economy. In the US and Europe, most people now work not in agriculture or manufacturing, but in some kind of service sector. Healthcare, retail, education, entertainment, information technology, internet videos about world history, etc. And that switch has really changed our psychology, especially the psychology of upper classes living in the industrialized world. I mean, to quote Frederick Jameson, we are so far removed from the realities of production and work that we inhabit a dream world of artificial stimuli and televised experience. Think of it this way, if you had to kill a chicken every time you visited KFC, you would probably eat fewer chickens. Another change of psychology? Many historians of the now note that globalization has also led to a celebration of individualism, particularly in the wake of the failures of the Marxist collectivist utopias. The generation that lived through the Depression and World War II saw large-scale collectivist responses to both those crises. And they were responses that limited freedom, like the military draft, for instance, which limited your freedom, you know, not to be a soldier. Or the collectivization of health insurance seen in most of the post-war West, which limited your freedom to go bank bankrupt from healthcare costs. Or also government programs like Social Security, which limit your freedom not to pay for old people's retirement. But since the 1960s, the ascendant idea of personal freedom minimally limited by government intervention has become very powerful. Even the Catholic Church was part of this new search for individual freedom, as the Second Vatican Council relaxed church rules in ways that weakened central authority, made concessions to individual styles of worship, even said that people of different religions could go to heaven? What good is heaven if it's gonna be full of Protestants, it's just gonna be like Minnesota. So here in the last episode of Crash Course World History, in the last 30 seconds, I've offended uh, five-sixths of the world's population in the form of non-Catholics and uh, all Republicans and probably some political moderates who are confused about what Obama's health care law will and will not do. Uh, Stan, maybe I should just make this episode just an extended rant where I reveal all of my political biases and also my personal biases. Look, you're never gonna meet a historian who doesn't have biases, but good historians try to acknowledge their biases, and I am biased toward Canada and its awesome healthcare system. I can't lie, I'm very jealous of you guys. But, but individualism also had a destabilizing effect on families. As the great Leo Tolstoy put it, all happy families are alike, but each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. But when your individual fulfillment trumps all, you needn't live amid your unique 
typically unhappy family, you can just leave. So divorce rates have skyrocketed in the past few decades, and not just in the U.S. By the turn of the 21st century, divorce rates in China reached nearly 25%, with 70% of those divorces initiated by women. Technology has also driven families apart, as parents and children spend increasing time alone in front of their individual screens, sharing fewer experiences. That's individualism, too, but not of a kind that we usually celebrate. But probably the biggest consequence of globalization and the ensuing rise in human population has been humanity's effect on the environment. While populations have increased partly thanks to better yields from existing farmland, much more land has also been brought under cultivation in the past half century. Often this meant cutting down trees and valuable rainforests. The best known example of this is what's going on in the Amazon, but it happens worldwide. And we're losing land not just for food, but also to grow the global economy. Oh, it's time for the open letter? An open letter to flowers. But first, let's see what's in the secret compartment today. Oh, it's fake flowers. Thank you, Stan. One for behind each ear. Dear flowers, you capture the best and the worst of the globalized economy. You're so pretty, even the fake ones are pretty, but the real ones are constantly dying. They've gotta be harvested and shipped and cut very efficiently, and it's a global phenomenon. Like, there are flowers in my corner market from Africa. These are from China, but because they are plastic, they could just be shipped in a shipping container. More people can afford to apologize by giving their romantic partners professionally cut and arranged roses than in any time in human history, but in that we have lost something, which is that the whole idea of flowers is that you had to go out into the field and like cut them and arrange them yourself to apologize. It's not supposed to be, I'm sorry I forgot your birthday, here's eight dollars worth of work that was done in Kenya. It's supposed to be, I'm sorry I forgot your birthday, so I went into the fracking forest and got you some fracking flowers. Anyway, flowers, best wishes, John Green. Ah, you guys got me flowers for my last episode of World History. Okay, let's go to the thought bubble. As worldwide production and consumption increases, we use more resources, especially water and fossil fuels. Globalization has made the average human richer, and rich people tend to use more of everything, but especially energy. This has already resulted in climate change, which will likely accelerate. The global economy isn't a zero-sum game, like, I don't need to become more poor in order for someone else to become more rich. But growth, at least so far, has been dependent upon unsustainable use of the planet's resources. The planet can't sustain 7 billion automobiles, for instance, or 7 billion frequent flyers, although most of us who can afford to drive or fly feel entitled to do so. You'll remember that when we talked about the Industrial Revolution, we discussed the virtuous cycle of more efficiency making things cheaper, which in turn made them easier to buy, which increased demand, which increased efficiency. But from the perspective of the planet, each turn in that cycle takes something. More land under cultivation, more carbon emissions, more resource extraction. That can't go on forever, but worryingly, our current models of economic growth don't allow for any other way. Thanks, Thought Bubble. And then there is our astonishingly robust health. Although much of the world has been ravaged by HIV AIDS for the past three decades, there's been a relative lack of global pandemics since the 1918 flu. And that's particularly surprising given increased population density and more travel between population centers. China has seen 150 million people leave the countryside for cities in the last 20 years. This was Shanghai in 1990, and this is Shanghai in 2010. The population of Lagos was 41,000 in 1900. Today, it's almost 8 million. Of course, people have been moving from country to city for a long time. Remember Gilgamesh? But the pace of that change has dramatically accelerated. Similarly, there's nothing new about international trade, but its pace has also increased dramatically. In 1960, trade accounted for 24% of the world's GDP. Today, it's more than doubled that. Almost no human being alive today lives with stuff only manufactured in their home country. But a thousand years ago, only the richest of the rich could benefit from the Silk Road. Still, trade isn't new, and while it's tempting to say that the types of goods being traded, pharmaceuticals, computers, software, financial services, represent something wholly new, you could just as easily see this as part of the evolution of trade itself. At some point, silk was seen as a new trade good. As tastes change and consumer 
consumers become more affluent, the things they want to buy change. So is anything really different, or is it all just accelerated? Well, some historians argue that an economically interdependent world is much less likely to go to war. And that may be true, but increasing global, cultural, and economic integration hasn't led to an end to violence. I mean, we've seen large-scale ethnic and nationalistic violence from Rwanda to the former Yugoslavia to the Democratic Republic of Congo to Afghanistan. Globalization has not rid the world of violence. But there is an ideological shift in the age of globalization that does seem pretty new, and that's the turn to democracy. Now, this isn't the limited democracy of the ancient Greeks or the quirky Republican system originally developed in the U.S. There are almost as many kinds of democracies as there are nations experiencing democracy. The fact is, however, that democracy and political freedom, especially the freedom to participate in and influence the government, have been on the rise all over the world since the 1980s, and especially since 1990. For instance, if you looked at the governments of most Latin American countries during most of the 20th centuries, you would usually find them ruled by military strongmen. Now, with a couple of exceptions, Fidel, Hugo, Stan, are they behind me right now? Because if they're behind me, I am in favor of collectivizing oil revenue and distributing it to the poor. If they're not behind me, that's a terrible idea. Right, but anyway, democracy is now flourishing in most of Latin America. Probably the most famous democratic success story is South Africa, which jettisoned decades of apartheid in the 1990s and elected former dissident Nelson Mandela as its first black president in 1994. It also adopted one of the most progressive constitutions in the world, but it's worth remembering that democracy and economic success don't always go hand in hand as much as some Americans wish they would. Many new African democracies continue to struggle. The same is true in some Latin American countries, and China has shown that you don't need democracy in order to experience economic growth. But for a few countries, especially Brazil and India, the combination of democracy and economic liberalism has unleashed impressive growth that has lifted millions out of poverty. So can we say that it's good then? Can we celebrate globalization in spite of its destabilizing effects on families and the environment? Well, here's where we have to imagine the future, because if some superbug shows up tomorrow and it travels through all these global trade routes and kills every living human, then globalization will have been very bad for human history, specifically by ending it. If climate change continues to accelerate and displaces billions of people and causes widespread famines and flooding, then we will remember this period of human history as short-sighted, self-indulgent, and tremendously destructive. On the other hand, if we discover an asteroid hurtling toward Earth and mobilize global industry and technology in such a way that we lose Bruce Willis but save the world, then globalization will be celebrated for millennia. I mean, assuming we have millennia and can convince Bruce Willis to go. In short, to understand the present, we have to imagine the future. That's the thing about history. It depends on where you're standing. From where I'm standing, globalization has been a net positive. But then again, it's been a pretty good run for heterosexual males of European descent. Critics of globalization point out that billions haven't benefited much, if at all, from all this economic prosperity, and that the polarization of wealth is growing, both within and across nations. And those criticisms are valid, and they are troubling. But they aren't new. Disparities between those who have more and those who have less have existed pretty much from the moment agriculture enabled us to accumulate a surplus. At some times, this inequality has been a big concern, as it was with Jesus and with Muhammad. At other times, not so much. Inequalities are as old as human history, and almost as old as the debate about them. One thing that is new, however, is our ability to learn about them, to discuss them, and hopefully to find solutions for them together as a global community that is better integrated and more connected than it has ever been before. Because here's the other thing about history. You are making it. That old idea that history is the deeds of great men, that was wrong. Celebrated individuals do shape history, but so do the rest of us. And while it's true that many historical forces, malaria, meteors from space, aren't human, it's also true that every human is a historical force. You are changing the world every day, and it is our hope that by looking at the history that was made before us, we can see our own crucial decisions in a broader context. And I believe that context can help us make better choices and better changes. Thanks for watching.